losing Michelle and the, the curve that I went through then created the space out of which has come my business, you know, running leadership courses for organizations and um, setting up the online. So I've got this online video platform about, about leadership and all, and all of those things. It just isn't where I would have been in in a world if that change hadn't been forced on me. And, you know, that was a very unwelcome change, clearly. But time and space are essential. And I, I quote um, in the TED Talk, Octavia Hill, who founded the National Trust, and she talks about us all needing uh, that sense of space and peace out of which come the whispers of better things. You know, the idea that you have to have space in order to to create anything good otherwise you're just carrying on and on as you are so today we have on the show neil jard who is up in the, the north of england neil is a leadership coach a leadership development expert neil was in sandhurst he's a former army officer and he's led soldiers on operations and expeditions around the world which is where he learned a lot about leadership Unfortunately, he's had some tragic events in his life, the death of his mother when he was 16, the death of his wife in a car accident. This actually led to him setting up a charity, the Michelle Jard Trust that he's going to be talking about, and actually led to him setting up his business. That was his light in the darkness that got him through, and also he's going to be talking around how exercise was a big part of that. So really looking forward to learning from Neil today. Neil, when I was explaining this concept of the, the cosmic bridge to you, you know, combining the the balance of material and spiritual and kind of finding light in the in the darkness you said that there's been several pivotal lucky or tragic events that you've had in your life so it wasn't easy to say what is your cosmic bridge but i thought maybe we could take a step back what was one of those first events that, that happened to you in your life i think it was probably the death of my mother when i was 16 and uh you know, obviously that's a very, very young age to, to lose a parent and it hit me quite hard. And I had, I think, several years of being less focused and less successful than I, than I had been before, um, which actually led to me joining the army shortly afterwards. I was always going in the army, but not doing particularly well and leaving. Um, and I think that the, the, the um, I guess the grief curve, as I'd understand it now, that I went through was was very deep and something that I didn't particularly understand. Uh, uh, but from that, from what what were a very difficult few years of almost drifting, really. I mean, I you know I did quite well at school up until the point that my that my mum died. Um, but then there was a very I had a very conscious decision to really pull it all together. And it, it it took it took probably four years, but then I went back to Sandhurst and uh, worked extremely hard and um, did did very well. Actually, came got got the top the top place for my regiment at the at the academy. Um, so it was very much a comeback, but like not a not a Rocky Bill Bauer kind of heroic comeback. Actually, a really tough journey that just led me to understand that nobody else was going to do it for me that that it was it was only my effort and focus that would bring me su success so i kind of had the choice of whether to apply myself or whether to feel unlucky and um you know after a few years of probably feeling unlucky i i i came back and really applied myself all right so you said something that i hadn't heard called the the grief curve and i know been reading a lot recently around like in the west for example we don't really like prepare ourselves for grief or for death it's almost like we we deny it in a way and it's not something we look at versus some more like eastern traditions and religions they're very much kind of preparing you for death there's like the tibetan book of the dead for example for the buddhist but yeah the term grief curve that's not something i've heard before so as one of you could talk us through that well it's the i guess it's the recovery well, it's the, it's the depths that you go into. And I can't remember all the stages, to be honest, but it is a defined um, model that people go through. But you you kind of, you you go initially through, I think, denial. Um, then you go into anger. Uh, in fact, I probably can remember all the stages. Then you go into acceptance. 
and then you go into recovery um and that denial stage is just you know you kind of in in grief it's often not accepting the person's gone thinking you see them in the the street um just trying to carry on as if nothing's changed and then the anger is that feeling of extreme unfairness why has this happened to to us um why has this happened to me and rather than dealing with it just fighting it um and then acceptance is i guess where you realize that you know stuff stuff like this does happen it happens all the time to you know to pretty much anyone you you encounter will have been through some tough and unpleasant things um and the recovery is when when you deal with it uh so so that's that's the process and when you know it you'll see that we go through it in many different circumstances when someone loses their job they go through a, a microcosm of the the grief curve and obviously the more major or traumatic the event the more likely you are to go through it but we we all go through it. To 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 not go through it would be to be suppressing something. I think very um, very dangerous inside you. There's a it's like a natural process actually of you not going through this. Then there's something as you said you're like suppressing some type of emotion. It it takes it takes years. I mean, it, depending on what it is. But for for a bereavement of someone very close to you, uh, it takes years. Perhaps if you're comfortable, we could walk through like your own journey through that curve and like how you went from as you said you know um denial all the way through to acceptance as you said eventually you're in sandhurst and doing well but kind of what was that personal journey for you it's a long time ago mike you know i mean I, i've been through and I, and I will but i i've been through it probably more recently again with the the loss of my wife which was um 12, 12 years ago and uh you know, it was a in many ways a similar journey. But I mean, when I was when I was younger, it was not applying myself properly at school, and um, you know, kind of just going for the bare minimum. I'd always done very well up until the uh, the fifth year, what would what would be year eleven now, and uh, I got very good GCSEs, but for some reason i just i just couldn't concentrate for my a levels and i got them but i got like the lowest possible grade for um for two of them and then the subjects i was particularly good at i got okay grades at but only only cuz i was naturally good at them not cuz i worked um you know i kind of got c's instead of a's um and i think i fell out with my my dad a lot who was obviously going through his own um his own grief and trying to make enough money for the for the family because the the thing people i guess forget unless you've been through it is that when you lose one of the parents in a family instantly you've got money troubles because you know the ch or, or the childcare disappears and i was um 16 when my mum died but my younger brother was 11 um so yeah i i kind of lost my interest in um in work i drunk too much too young and and again you know people probably used to drink more back then um but we used to go to the the, the pub in the evening certainly when i was 17 or 18 um and i think it really manifested itself when i got to sandhurst and um sandhurst is you know fairly demanding environment and i had a scholarship to sandhurst and I think I just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't mature enough for it. And I wasn't, I think I, I mean, it, it's very hard to self-analyze, but for whatever reason, I chose to leave after two terms. Um, in the long run, that was the right thing to do because I went back in when I was in the right place and had a very successful army career, um, which I think I probably wouldn't have had if I pushed through too soon in a mediocre way. I was I was actually much better going away and sorting myself out. And the sorting myself out happened after I'd left Santos that time. And my dad was becoming hugely exasperated with me then. I think I was 19 at the time. And then I just had this kind of click moment. I was doing easy to do jobs. I think I was selling life insurance at one stage, which was just a, a complete racket, actually. Um, 
and I just had this kind of renaissance moment where I just realized that I was on the track to waste my life and almost instantly I just changed it's it's very odd but I and I just started running and getting back to a uh, very high level of fitness I entered marathons um I did quite a lot of marathons I think over over a one year period I wrote to Sandhurst and asked if they'd let me back in and remarkably they said yes um which is I think quite un, quite unusual and I think I was extremely fortunate with that so I prepared like mad um and then when I went back I just worked so hard I was so I you know it's maybe a fear of failure having come very close to failure for I guess a year that was very unpleasant and the first time in my life that I'd, I'd ever been in that bracket uh, I realized that if I didn't try hard enough stuff stuff bad stuff was going to happen you know I was going to end up um having a much less successful and enjoyable life than I than I would so I guess that fear of failure morphed into a determination to succeed so um you know I was kind of first up last to bed I, if there was something to study I made sure that I was absolutely you know came top on it or or did my absolute best to come top and um that that led to me getting a very good posting after Sandhurst and then I, you know after that I've uh never looked back actually in in work terms I I never do anything badly so it sounds like in terms of you getting yourself back on the right track, there was almost three things. It was like you said, the fitness, because even before you went back to Sandhurst, you started getting like very physically yeah. fit, running running marathons. Um, and then there was like the discipline and the the hard work. Once you went there, you went in with a really good attitude that you were going to throw everything at it. Yeah, it's a very unforgiving place. I mean, if you go there in a half-hearted way, well, certainly about 30 years ago now, if you go there in a half-hearted way, you, you don't get through is is there's there's uh, your journey is is miserable if you're not giving your all if you give your all it's an absolutely beautiful place my my first experience there in 89 was totally different from my second experience there um a couple of years later it's uh, you know it's it's, it's absolutely a uh, it's a wonderful location the insistence on excellence is just it's actually quite uplifting as long as you're willing to live up to it yeah. So I'm going to come on later to obviously what you're doing now. You're a leadership coach. You've written a great leadership book. But I wanted to come back to the, the Sandhurst time. So what did you learn during that period? Like how did being at Sandhurst define you as a person going forward? And maybe you can just, because I think um, some people listening to this may not be British, so they may not actually know what Sandhurst is. So maybe if you could explain a little bit like what happens at Sandhurst as well. Yeah. So, so Sandhurst is the... Uh, the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst is where British Army officers are trained. And uh, it, I think it's been there since 1802, I think, some, something like that. So, so it's a very historic um, place. It's for, for if you've got American listeners, it's, it's our West Point. Um, and it, it's a one year course. And during that year, you learn first how to be a soldier and then you move on to learn how to be an officer. Uh, so it's a kind of, a, there's a lot of fitness there. There's a lot of field skills. You learn um, you know, how, how to live, how to live in the field, how to operate. And then, then you kind of move on to how to plan, how to operate under pressure, um, how to insist on high standards, how, how to do things well. And, and in terms of what I learned from it, it was a period of development, but I I would say from that and maybe from my career that followed that, um, doing things well, you know, that the, the, there isn't there isn't an option that, that you do things that you do things well. And, and um, but then also maybe something a little bit kind of a, a willingness to take risk as well, a sense that. Um, that if you think things through, if you understand the situation, you can 
you can be quite innovative and you can take risks. And I think that probably came came from my time there as well, um, which are things that I do that I you know that I've carried on in my my life since. You talked earlier quite openly around you know what happened with your mum. You've got a charity now for um, your wife's legacy as well. So you're talking quite openly about these things. And the reason I'm going in this direction is I was actually listening to a podcast with Simon Sinek, who also does leadership coaching, talking about the why, and he does a lot of work actually with um, the army, like in in North America. And one of the things he was saying, which I was actually very surprised by, so I wanted to hear if you've had a similar experience, is. He actually found that people in the the army and the services were more open actually to like speaking about their emotions and some of these things. And I found that quite surprising because I guess in my head, I had this like stereotype that like tough macho guys in the army, they're not really opening up to each other. But he said, because there's such a camaraderie and you're going through this like suffering almost together, people were actually quite open with each other. But I don't know if you had that same experience as Simon did. Yeah, yeah, we, we you get very close relationships and friendships. Um, and I, uh, I think we are very open ab- about things that the, the stereotypes of kind of the shouting and the hierarchy, um, that they're, they're just not true. They, they maybe, maybe were in the 1950s with national service, but, but really when, when you're in a team, I mean, I've served in Iraq, Yemen, Sierra Leone and so on. And w- when you're in a dangerous place with people, you know, they're, they're, they're the only emotional support you've got. You're, the people around you are the only emotional support you've got. Um, so the stereotypes just aren't true. There's a lot less, I mean, rank exists in that it's a position that somebody will be in charge. Mm-hmm. But um, you very, very rarely see see it as a barrier. Uh, we're, we're, you know, the army is extremely good for, for leadership, for teaching people how to lead and how to build good teams. And building good teams is about really knowing people, really spending time. And we're, you know, we're very, the organization would be very critical of bad leadership. People know what good leadership looks like. And we expect it. Soldiers expect it of of the people that lead them. Um, I I certainly expected it of the people that, that led me. So you're expected to be good. You're, um, I think, one of the things that's in my book that came came out of the army is the idea that leadership is just it's just a job. You're just another member of the team. It's just that your particular responsibility is to lead, but you're no better than the other people in the team. It's just your job to lead. Somebody else's job could be to be the medic or to um, do the logistics for the team, but but you're all equals as people. Yeah, I think what you're what you're describing there, I would call like some leadership, which I think is great. I imagine, you know, fast forwarding to nowadays, I guess even there would be people like this in the army. You're not always going to have leaders that you work with that do have that mentality of of servant leadership. So when you do get more of those leaders with like more of an ego, more of an authoritarian personality, how do you deal with that? Is there is there a guy, is there a path for them to become servant leaders, or is it very difficult to work with people like that? You mean work with them from my point of view, professionally developing them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, most people know nothing about leadership. Like ge- genuinely, they'll have had little or probably no leadership training. And and that will include people who are very senior. People can get to director level in quite large organisations or to um, head teacher or deputy head teacher or, or whatever and never have been taught to lead. So... It's really amazing when you open up the idea of what good leadership looks like to people, how receptive they are to it. Most leadership mistakes come from ignorance. They, People will never have seen good leadership, um, but they'll have seen people being in charge of them who perhaps lead less well, and they'll copy that. Um, and they'll focus on the wrong things. They'll focus on numbers and statistics and driving performance rather than um, purpose and people and inspiration and connection. So actually a lot of it is just showing people what good leadership is, just just showing them that it's about being yourself. And that's really important, not, not playing the part. All bad leaders are usually behaving like they think somebody of their rank or grade should behave. And, and it's a nonsense. Because 
everything that happens, they then have to think not do what do I want to do, but what would someone in my position do? And that kind of dissonance makes for really bad decision making. And of course, you can't connect unless you're being yourself. Nobody wants to connect to the grade eight manager. They want to connect to, you know, Steve or Melissa or whatever. You know, they want they want to connect to you as a person, not not to your grade. Rank and grade get in the way so much. It's it's one of it's one of the things that um again it surprises people with my army background. But if you let your rank get in the way, so much truth gets lost. Yeah. And you end up dealing with a false sense of reality. So um actually I'm I'm not I'm not anti-rank. You probably need someone whose yeah. job it is to be in charge, but their their job's to get the best out of other people. Very interesting. Yeah, I was even thinking to what you said around, you know, being your authentic self, not being someone or pretending to be someone. Cause even in my profession with uh with sales training. Uh, we when we work with salespeople, often they have this like alter ego where they're oh, I'm calling a CEO or I'm selling to a finance director. I need to be more corporate. Actually, people don't like that. They want to see a human, right? And especially, I think in this era we're living in of social media, being as authentic as you can be, and as you said, it's you know very relevant for leadership as well. Oh. I, I worked with somebody who was a he was an assistant director in a university at the time, and. He had a he played a character. He did his job as um and, and we in a coaching session we defined it. I said, you know, you, you've got this this like alter ego, as you as you've just said, Mikey. I said, and it's um, you know, it's like big friendly Bob, isn't it? It's like it's not really you, it's the you that you put on when you're dealing with people. And it's not it's not authentic. So you're you know, there's this kind of smile and this jolliness, but it it's not substantial. How does anyone know who you are? when all they're getting is the performance. And we worked on that for, well, for session after session, it kept coming back. And in the end that shifted and it, it brought out a whole load of stuff. I mean, it actually led to him, um, well, coming out like publicly, letting people know that um, that he was gay, which he hadn't done um, for years. And that, that was causing a lot of, I think, frustration and unhappiness in him. Um, but this, he was giving a presentation of what he thought people wanted of him rather than just being himself. And I, you know, I still work with him, actually, like eight or nine years later. And he's become incredibly successful, like absolutely top top level in his, well, in another organisation. And um, it, I think the, at the root of it is being comfortable being himself. Yeah, 100%. Do you, in your in your work as a leadership coach, um, do you ever get people with imposter syndrome? Because I'm just trying to connect dots here. And I think often why people have an alter ego or they're not themselves is they think, oh, like I'm an imposter here. I don't have the experience or the title to actually do this job. And therefore they become someone else. Do you ever kind of feel that with some of your clients? All of them. <laughs> but I, I think genuinely all of them. Uh, uh, it, it, it's one of those things I... For ages, I thought it would be really good if I just wrote down what coaches learn, because the stuff that when you've worked with hundreds of people over a few years, you start to spot patterns that people don't know about other people because they only say it to a coach or maybe to other very privileged relationships. Um, but it's exceptionally common, exceptionally common to some degree. I mean, whether it affects people's performance or not that that may vary but it's cropped up in almost every conversation a sense that you know I perhaps I shouldn't be in this job maybe I got this job a bit early or there's bits I don't really understand that I'm covering up um or it could be that you're you know you're put in a leadership appointment and you know full well that you don't know how to lead and and that alone is enough to make you feel like an imposter you're going through the motions of being in charge but you don't actually know how how to build the right relationships or build your team. Um, a lot of people in charge, I won't say leaders because that's a, that's confusing to call them leaders if they can't lead, is a lot of people in charge genuinely don't know what to do. They don't understand that when you've got a lot of people that work for you, your role isn't to work really hard. Your role is to think about what you're trying to achieve and then connect other people. You kind of have your effect with but very much through others and 
if you don't know that and you're trying to do it all on your on your own you then become really worried about what you're achieving personally and what what other people think of what you're doing as well you're like you're putting on a show of being busy to impress the people that work for you Le leadership shouldn't be hard yeah. so a big theme in my work is it shouldn't be hard yeah so let's talk about that because i know before the show you said that to me as well which is you know leadership is is more simple than than people realize and i'm even putting myself in my own shoes going back to when i was first managing a sales team or a marketing team or even when i set up my own company i'd never had training how should you be a founder or a ceo how should you be a sales yeah. manager right so let's imagine there's someone listening to this that they just started managing a team for the first time what are some of those simple bits of advice that, that you would give them really understand what you're trying to achieve whatever it is whether it's whether it's a small team and in your first role in management or whether it's something much much larger be absolutely clear what it is you're trying to achieve and and um I talk about the idea of clear and compelling purpose. So you can express it in very simple language and it should be something that's interesting enough to get people excited. So if you're if you're setting something up, then you have to make sure that there's a, re a good reason for it being there and it's a reason that other people will want to engage with and that's your best motivator. If you If you can connect people with purpose if they buy into it if you can get them excited about what they're trying to achieve leadership becomes a lot easier if, if they're not excited about what they're trying to achieve that's where you get the the manager as a sheepdog because nobody will want to do anything because what you're doing is not that interesting so the manager ends up kind of chasing everybody checking the detail of how much they've done or um have they worked hard enough? Were they in on time? But if your purpose is is clear and compelling and you've got people to connect with it, you will have a lot less to do. And you can think about what you're supposed to be doing, which is kind of more big picture stuff. And that gets really, that almost sounds like um, a, a cliche from, um, you know, kind of a cheesy management thing. But by big picture, it's just know where you're going and have the space and the time to think about it. Um the second thing is really connect with people. Just be yourself. What we were talking about 10 minutes ago, just be yourself. Sit down with people. I I, um, I say in the book, if someone offers you a cup of tea, always accept it because it means that they want to, they want you for the duration of that cup of tea. They want you to sit down and chat to them. It's a great sign. If someone who works for you says, do you want a brew? Have a brew. They're saying, do you, what they're really saying is, do you want a chat? Probably have a chat, get to know them and really get to know them, know, know about their family, know about um, what they do in their spare time, what if they're into sport, who they who they support. Um, only by really understanding the person, and that's a two-way street as well, you know, you're not interviewing them downwards, you have a real conversation, because those relationships build the connection that um, you need. So, so when... When you've got great relationships in a team, things are generally possible. The team will be able to do a bit more. It's got some resilience and some surge. People will look after people. People will come in when they're having a bad day because, Christ, why, why wouldn't I? This is the team. I want to I want to be with these people. I'm having a bad day at home. Let me come and spend time at work. It kind of it, it pulls you in. You want to be part of something and you mutually support. Where you get bad relationships everything is more difficult. It creates a level of friction to any activity, even the smallest decision, you know, person one will suggest, person two will always undermine person one's actions. And you'll see it, you know, over, over a year, certain people's relationship, they can't agree on anything and it, it slows things down. So get great relationships and really, that's leadership. And then you just have to use those great relationships to keep people connected to, to what you're trying to achieve. So it's, it's a humble process. Yeah, for sure. And so I wanted to come on to kind of a bit of a topic of this podcast, right? The cosmic bridge, which is like, how can we balance, you know, our material lives and our, our spiritual lives? And I'm thinking about this from a, from a leadership perspective, because I think, 
you talked around purpose, which is obviously so important as a leader, but then it's also connecting to your staff's purpose as well, the teams you're leading's purpose. And a big mistake I see with, with leaders, some of the sales leaders I work with, they're very clear on like the material targets, but they're not clear on what ones may call like the spiritual targets, right? Or more of like the human targets. So when it comes to trying to connect on an emotional level, how do you, what's your advice for like a leader who wants to have more of that like human connection with some of their staff? What are some of the things they can work on there? Get over yourself because the, the lack of human connection is probably because you're playing a part that you think that you're torn between I'm a manager and you're my staff and now I need to connect with you. And that kind of, you know, that if you've got that mindset that, look, I'm a bit better than you, but I'm going to give you a bit of time to connect with you. Well, it's not going to work because people, you know, you can absolutely feel other people's emotions. You totally can. Um, to the extent that there have been experiments where people can be, well, this will sound absurd, but people can be exposed to a photograph showing an emotion, positive or negative, that they can't see. So the photos flash up on a screen with either a smile or a frown, but you're blindfolded. And statistically, people can still correctly press the button for positive or negative from an emotion via a screen that they can't even see. How does that work? But it's a you know a, a statistically significant um, weighting in favor of being able to sense it. So you can sense an emotion of someone who's not even there that you can't see. So an inauthentic leader hasn't got a chance. People know if you're not with them. The only way to be with them is to really understand yourself and all your own insecurities, everything that creates a barrier between you and others. And that barrier is probably there for your own protection. Most leaders who have that barrier have it because it stops them being challenged. And it's really convenient if they're wrong, they can say, just do it. But just do it is very rarely in the best interest of the organization. Very, very rarely does just do it actually get much done. So taking that ego, that barrier, that inauthent inauthenticity out of it by fully understanding yourself and thinking. So there's, there's another phrase I use in the book. Leadership is just plain you. It comes from uh, a speech that um, Phil Marshall Slim gave, a, a, a army officer from the Second World War. But leadership is just plain you. Um, once you're happy with just plain you, you, you'll build great relationships. If you've got any discomfort with just plain you, work on it, because that will get in the way. Once you're just plain you, other people can be just plain them, and suddenly the truth comes out. People will tell you what's wrong, where they need support, why they really are missing work two times a month. And, 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 you know, once you've got to the truth, you can actually get some work done. Yeah. I really, one of the, my main takeaways from this is I really like what you said around, like, even if you're a leader, manager, speaking to your staff like peers, because again, going back to my professional sales training, when someone's trying to sell to someone, we say, speak to the other person as peer, like you're, you can help them. It's like you said, flipping it, where actually you're the leader, also speak to the other person like a peer, because then there's a mutual respect there as well. And it actually works the other way. If you're in a team, and, and unfortunately, bad leadership can crush this, but if you're in a team, you want to be able to feel absolutely you can speak to your, your boss as a peer. So if something's, if something's wrong, if something needs to be changed, you, you have no hesitation. And I, I think, um, so I've always found it very strange that schools overuse sir and miss when you hear two teachers, I don't know whether you've been into a school since you left school, but if you do, you'll find this really odd situation where two adults who know each other's first names, often when there are no pupils around, still refer to each other as sir and miss. I think that's a crazy barrier. Like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you? The, 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 our own name 
is something that's really special to us. You know, when we hear, we, we, we will hear our name across a room. You know, you know, have you ever had that experience where you, you hear someone say Mikey and you think, what's yeah. that? And it, and it yeah. could be in a, in a, amongst busy chatter, it still gets your attention. Um, so I find this, this schools thing where there's a lot of hierarchy, you know, the head teacher can often be very removed in their own office. You have to get through the PA to get there. And there's, you know, these kind of barriers that stop. They're barriers to the team, actually. And I, I don't really understand them. I know the head has to get things done. But other than just getting your work done, why wouldn't you want your staff to feel as connected to you and as able to access you as possible? Yeah, 100%. Um, what I wanted to to cover just towards the end of the podcast there was around your wife's, uh, well, the charity you've set up in, in honour of your wife. Can you tell us a little bit more about like why you, why you set it up? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I I mean, I, I lost my wife just after I left the army. She, she was killed in a crash, but Michelle had been a helicopter navigator in the Royal Air Force. So she'd had a really active exciting career and then uh we had our, our our daughters were born in 2005 and 2007 so michelle left the air force in 2008 and actually i i then left the army in 2009 so we could live together as a family without either of us going off for six months or a year at a time um but unfortunately michelle died in a crash the well a few weeks after i i left the army um but uh, partly to, so I had to leave my job because my youngest daughter was still in nappies at the time and my eldest was only, only four. So I had to leave my job so I could um, look after the girls. But I, partly to keep me sane initially, if I'm really honest about it, you know, I, again, I went through a stage where I did a hell of a lot of exercise, but I also gave myself some purpose. I probably, the first bereavement set me up to have a reasonable chance of surviving the second, which was probably harder. Um, but I set up a charity in memory of Michelle, which promotes adventurous training for young people. Uh, Michelle loved the mountains. She loved she loved the outdoors. Uh, and also gives money to service charities because I was, a, as, as you know, an army officer and Michelle was a, an Air Force officer. Um, and that's been going now for, it's called the Michelle Jure Trust, and it's been going for, or since 2009 anyway and um we've raised hundreds of thousands of pounds and it's been it's been very successful it's something i'm i'm i think very proud that i've done and it, it in a way it was a way of keeping her i felt like it was too early for her to leave the world so it was a way of kind of keeping her in some way i mean the cost is it's, it's a tiny substitute for a person but in some way a a way of keep keeping her um, positive effect in the world alive for a bit longer. So on this the topic, you know, with your with your wife and what you said uh, about your mum when when you were younger, I know one of the topics you wanted to discuss was talking about having space and time to recover, uh, grow and think. And I've, obviously you went through this process yourself. You talked about the grief curve. But I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about this. Well, the type the the space theme is a big theme in my work and um I, I recorded a, a TEDx talk about it was only three or four weeks ago actually on, on this subject the, the importance of sometimes just stepping back I think that the world is quite relentless and the working world particularly and maybe post-COVID it's got even worse for those of us that are still um or certainly anyone working in a big organization it seems to be a relentless series of online meetings um and i think the result of that is we don't have time to think and and if we don't have time to think whatever we do is literally mindless you know that that's the very definition of mindless isn't it you're operating without any any thought um for me thinking time has been when the, the changes, the ideas, the creativity comes out of space. So uh, losing Michelle and the, the curve that I went through then created the space out of which has come my business. 
you know, running leadership courses for organizations and um, setting up the online. So I've got this online video platform about about leadership and all, and all of those things. It just isn't where I would have been in in a world if that change hadn't been forced on me. And, you know, that was a very unwelcome change, clearly. But where I am now, I'm I'm very pleased with Um covid gave me a, another you know I, I lost like a lot of people in the training world i lost a lot of business in the early weeks of covid but that's when i sat down and um wrote the book in that very beautiful summer of um of the first lockdown i it, it forced on me the the time that i didn't want and i wasn't ready for and i wrote the book which has been um very successful the leadership book has has sold a lot of copies and got really good reviews but that that wouldn't have happened if i'd plowed on as i was so time and space are essential and i, I quote um in the ted talk octavia hill who founded the national trust and she talks about us all needing um i think she's whispers of silence i think out of which come um no we all need that that uh, that sense of space and peace out of which come the whispers of better things you know, the idea that you have to have space in order to to create anything good otherwise you're just carrying on and on as you are yeah i really i really love that point because yeah it's a, it's a theme that's come up a lot on the podcast often through the darkest moments we have like the most creativity but i don't think anyone said it in the way you were saying it there which is around like we need that space because often we're so busy in our day-to-day -day lives and suddenly we have this tragic event and we reassess everything, put everything on hold. But sometimes that will lead to that space as you're talking about to be creative and work on new things. So. It's probably the same in, in sales. I mean, it's certainly in coaching. Um, and I've done a video, I, I recorded a video three or four months ago about si the importance of silence. Um, and people are really uncomfortable with silence. We, we, we like chatter and noise i think we feel reassured by it um but often out of in, in coaching the the best thing that you a coach can provide often is is nothing it's just just a sense of benevolent support but but nothing yeah. else you're just you're just creating space holding the space in which other people do their thinking and and i bet in sales the, the the salesperson who just jabbers away and fills every moment probably overwhelms the the potential customer and the customer just walks away needs some space yeah. is that the case 100 percent. yeah, yeah. If you send me if you send me the content you made we'll, we'll put it in the show notes and what i'll do as well i'll put in i i did a post last year and i show this to all the sales people we work with there's a guy called lex friedman he's got this and he's just like a basically a coder, but he's got this huge podcast now. And Elon Musk, all these people come on the show, as because Ooh. he's a brilliant he's a brilliant listener. And he basically asked Elon Musk a question. Elon Musk didn't answer for twenty seconds, but then gave him a really good answer, literally twenty seconds. And it was just Elon Musk was thinking. Whereas most salespeople, like you say, they ask a question, it's silent, and then they'll answer their own question because they're not comfortable with the silence. Where you just got to wait for the other person to speak. Well, most coaches will do that. They'll ask a question and it will be the question. And because it's the question, the person goes deep, but they go, but that going deep scares scares the coach who thinks, well, I'm being paid to coach. I better better ask another question. And they blow it. You sometimes see that moment where the coach blows it, the, the power's building, and then you just you you pop the balloon before before it's inflated. And it's yes, yeah, it's, it's I've seen it a lot in in training and it's um it's so frustrating. But when people get silence right, wow, it's really powerful. 100%. And uh, I just wanted to ask one last question here, Neil. What advice would you give to yourself, let's say, maybe when you were, you were 16 going through a, a tough time with your mum, what would current day Neil say to, to that person? It, it will get better. It, it always does. Or it always has so far. Whenever I've gone through anything difficult, and I've seen this with with lots of other people, with a very few exceptions, <laughs> but my experience has been that things have always got better. Whenever whenever there's a dip, um, if you if you keep turning up, 
and and I always I've always I mean fitness for me has always been very important so it's always been there as a although I didn't know the science behind it I, I always knew that if I ran for an hour I'd, I'd feel better and I've done that actually so I didn't I didn't mention that when my mum died but I used to although I said I used to I went off the rails a bit I also did did run even when I was 16 or 17 but the the thing that I've def I've, I've, I've learned is that th things tend to get better I realize that's slightly blase and there'd be people who'll have examples where things haven't got better but 90 percent of the time if, if you if you keep a sense of um of I guess working really if you if you keep trying if you keep going at it um things will normally work out for sure yeah and I don't think it's blase I think my partner Anna actually said something quite profound to me which is like however dark the night is the sun is always going to come out in the morning so as long as when the sun comes out you get on and get on with your life then everything's going to be okay oh. yeah and there's little rituals that help there's a a, a um a seals you know the u.s navy special forces there's, yeah. a, there's a famous talk by one of their admirals about making your bed every day um it's, it's quite I'm, I'm not sure what it's on but it's it's on youtube anyway and it's it's um it's quite well known but he says that every start every day by by completing this one basic task of making your bed um I'm not very good at making my bed, but, but, I, but I shave. What, like whatever, whatever I'm, however bad it is, I've I've always made a point of making sure I look presentable. It's just you know little rituals for yourself. I again, I personally I found that helps just just to go through the motions of something to um, to have a sense of continuity. Appreciate you being open about not being good at making your bed. You don't fit the <laughs> yeah. the army stereotype there. Um, <laughs> Just uh, we're going to put the the link to your TED talk and then also your your book. Um, so thought uh, as a finish, you could give a little bit of insight into your book and you know why the audience should read it. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I I wanted to write leadership. So I've always seen leadership as really something really simple um, that anybody can do. And I think there's a lot of nonsense around this. You know, people have what to me is such a blatantly wrong opinion that leadership is for is for special people you know only some people only some people are born to lead and I think that's an, an arrogant elitist um divisive absolutely not inclusive perspective and and the world is a better place if all of us can lead because leadership is just about having something you want to achieve and then bringing people to get it done and leadership can exist at um, you know, a street level. It can be organising the street party or the street cleaning. It can be at a community level, or, or it can be the sort of the bigger, more classic leadership that we think of. But where there's good leadership, pe people are happy. Things get done. Um, important things don't get ignored. People are safer. And and um, I, I start the book with a little piece where I say leadership makes the world a better place. Good leadership makes the world a better place and it really does well yeah as we said we'll put the, the link in the, the notes to buy it so everyone can check it out and yeah neil thanks a lot for for coming on today i've certainly learned some some good takeaways for leadership what a great show with neil really inspiring i certainly got some great leadership takeaways myself one of the things i really liked was talking to your employees and your staff as peers they see that you're better than them, have open and frank conversations with them and create that mutual respect where you both see each other as peers. And I also really loved what Neil talked about in that dark moment after his wife died. He had this space and that space actually led to creativity, which meant he was able to create his business. So obviously that theme of light in the darkness, it's come up a lot on the Cosmic Bridge. And he explained it as when you're going through those dark times, you've got this bigger void, this bigger space that can actually lead to more creativity. If there's anyone who you think could benefit from listening to this show, maybe someone who's going through grief, send them the podcast, subscribe to us across podcast platforms and on YouTube, and we'll see you next week.